This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Today's service call is on a, a walk-in cooler that's not working properly. The complaint is, is that the temps are high. This system is actually a uh, like a hybrid medium low temp and uh, they run like 20 degree box temp inside of here. So jump up onto the roof. We've obviously got nothing going on here and see what's going on. So I walked up to my unit and went ahead and pulled the cover off. Uh, nothing's running at the moment. Uh, first things I want to check is, you know, if condensed fan motors are locked up. They don't seem like they are. Um, compressor's not hot, which is worrisome. We're gonna have to put some service gauges on this guy. Uh, defrost clock without getting a meter out is in refrigeration mode. So we're gonna get a, uh, some gauges on this guy and then troubleshoot further. So my pressures are equalized out on the system. So at this point, we need to check the compressor contactor, just knowing the sequence of operation to see if we've got coil voltage going to it. On this particular system, the power should go through the low pressure control, the high pressure control, which are ran in series, and then go directly to my compressor contactor. This is a basic pump down system. First, we're gonna measure three phase power coming in. Make sure we got three phase. Should be a 208 volt circuit. So one, two, three. We have three phase power coming in. Let's measure across our coil. And we've got 208 volts going to our coil and it's indicating that we have an open coil on the contactor. So it looks like we have a bad compressor contactor. We're going to uh, get that contactor replaced and then troubleshoot further from there. Go ahead and power down the unit. Okay, let's double check power to make sure we're powered down before I stick my hands in there. Dead, dead. Dead, and you always want to check the ground too, find a good ground. Dead, dead, dead. Yeah. So the system's completely de energized. We can go ahead and replace this contactor. The new contactor comes with the coil on the bottom, so I got to rotate this around. I've shown this a million times. It'll drive me nuts if the writing's upside down. Kind of make a mental note or take a picture of the wiring and try to do a wire for wire. This one looks pretty tight, so I'm probably gonna have to disconnect some stuff. So it looks like our, uh, it's, the phase rotation actually doesn't matter on this guy because it's a hermetically sealed uh, reciprocating compressor. So everything's back and installed. And we're gonna turn it on and see what happens. Short cycling. That's not good. Why are we short cycling? Notice that on, off, on, off, on, off. Something's funky in there. Probably a pressure control issue. So what we need to do is look at our service gauges. or grab them. We need to see what happens while it's short cycling like that. Our pressures look fine. So something's wrong there. It's more than likely gonna be an issue in a pressure control because I've got the right contactor. And what we can do, test across the coil voltage and see what we get. See how we're getting that funky on off on off reading that's indicating to me that we've got a pressure control failure somewhere i'm going to take a hunch because of where we're at it's really really hot that it's the high pressure control that has failed in order to test that we can just bypass the pressure control and let the system run power's off we confirm that the disconnect works we'll cut this guy right here wire nut these two wires together and see if we still have the same issue. It could also be the, uh, uh, I see there's a high temperature limit switch too, right here. So it could be that too.
Okay, high pressure control is taken out of the picture. Let's turn it on and see what happens. Well, that compressor sounds really healthy. Sounds like an internal bypass on the compressor right now. So the compressor has the proper voltage, but it's making a god-awful sound. Hot discharge, actually warm discharge line, lukewarm suction line. Now the box temp is really high, but we shouldn't be. That's a, that's a bypass. This is a bad compressor. The compressor is so hot, it's ridiculous. And it's not even that hot outside right now. It's probably 90 degrees. And our liquid saturation temperature is way too low for a 90 degree ambient. We should have about 120 degree liquid saturation temperature. So what's happening is the discharge valve in the compressor is bad. Or the reed is bad or something. So this looks like it's gonna turn out to be a cluster F, but we're gonna have to change a compressor. I'm gonna have to get a hold of the uh, the higher ups of this particular restaurant and make sure they want me to do this right now, which I'm sure they do. We kind of have it all clear to go ahead with any major repairs like this, but still. Um, the other thing is, is we don't know what caused that or that uh, compressor to fail. So it's gonna be hot and sunny today, even though it's cloudy and overcast right now. So I put up my easy up. The problem is there's not enough room with this exhaust fan. So anything's better than nothing. It's not blowing the top off of it, so it'll give me some shade. At this point, we're gonna go ahead and recover. I went ahead and hooked up to the receiver for the high side. My suction Schrader, for whatever reason, I can't get it to come out, so we're gonna have to pull through the Schrader on the suction side, but we've got an open port on the receiver. And I'll go ahead and disconnect the coil voltage to the compressor contactor and turn the system on because I think this is an electric defrost system. I do need to confirm that. And if that's the case, the, um, when, the, when the unit's powered down, it uh, turns off the uh, solenoid valve. So by disconnecting the coil to the compressor contactor, I can open the solenoid valve, the system will be calling, and we'll get better refrigerant flow through the system, so. So I've got a tank here that already has some vapor in it. Uh, it's not really any liquid. Um, we gotta watch to the, the total charge of the system because this tank can only take 18 pounds of gas. Uh, so we're going to make sure that we uh, we don't overfill it, but at the same time, I know this system doesn't take more than 18 pounds, so we should be good. And on a smaller system like this, I don't mind pulling through my gauges. It's not gonna take that long to recover it. If it was really, really hot, I might hook up the Appian Megaflow manifold, but it's not that hot yet, so hopefully we get this recovered soon. I got someone coming to bring me a compressor right now. tank is leaking. Look at this, when I open it up, it's leaking out the valve, like the, the cap. And I push on this, that sucks. Well, I got another empty in my truck, I'll have to go get it. Sometimes these recovery tanks are so cheap, man, that pisses me off. All right, so let's try this again. At my supply house, if the tank comes with plastic, that means it's in a vacuum. That's correct, it's in a vacuum. So, we'll go ahead and get my high side, or my uh, discharge hooked up. Again, I've explained this a million times. I like to hook up to the vapor port, invert the tank, and then, uh, Well, 
off mode and did it, whatever. I'm not going to reuse this refrigerator anymore, but I should have purged right there. Alright. My scale, and I'll zero it out. Okay, so it's zeroed out, so that way it counts how much refrigerant I put into it. And uh, we'll go ahead and purge all the way up to this point right here on the recovery machine, the inlet. I'm going to open up my high side and my low side on my gauges. And crack the inlet hose. I haven't even turned on the recovery machine yet. We're waiting. Okay, so it's pushed all the gas in. It pushed in about a pound. Now I'm going to turn the recovery machine on. Just let it pump. And I also got to disconnect my coil voltage and uh, energize the system so that solenoid valve opens up. In order to disconnect the, the voltage, I'm just going to pull this jumper off right here. Make sure it's safely out of the way. Turn it on and now my coil should be energized. While it's recovering, I'm gonna go ahead and start sanding up the compressor and getting it ready to be replaced. Sand up the fittings and everything. I expected this system to have more than four pounds, four and a half, five pounds of gas. I expected it to have about nine pounds. So we're gonna make sure that uh, this unit doesn't have leaks. We're pulled into a negative four, but we're gonna shut it off at that because I don't want to uh, pull any more air into the system if it does have leaks. So um, we're gonna leave it at that and then go ahead and put all the recovery equipment away and then uh, get started on changing the compressor. I got the new compressor right here and uh, we'll get started on getting that replaced. So when I need to bring my whole van on the roof, it's kind of nice to have this hook. Uh, this hook is made by Klein and it's got a swivel on the top and it's really easy because you can, you know, like I brought my vacuum pump up and then I also keep a carabiner, a large carabiner on the other end of my rope. And I have about a 75 foot rope, so that way I can get up on some big roofs. And um, this way, if I'm bringing up a lot of stuff, I can shackle something and then hook something. And then sometimes I can, like right now, I swung that hook down and hooked it onto that from up here. So that way I can keep doing that. So it's nice to have a rope that's prepared for you. Nice, big, thick rope. All right, so I got some nitrogen flowing through this guy. Uh, it's really humid and buggy outside today. So I'm worried about moisture contamination. So we're going to start by doing things. I still have the system energized. I'm going to do it until the last minute. I'm a little lazy and don't want to put a solenoid magnet downstairs. So just got to be careful. I could do it by putting a solenoid magnet if I wanted to. But. Okay, that's my pressure control for the low side. We're going to go ahead and replace both of these pressure controls and put on a dual pressure control. Okay, so I'm going to power down for a minute. Disconnect the compressor leads and also disconnect the crankcase heater, which is energized. I don't know what someone was thinking with all that crap. It's like duct tape or something on there. Some people's kids, man. Okay, that's safe. That's safe. Let's go ahead and disconnect these guys. Remember, I already checked the disconnect and we know that it works. And what I'm gonna do, even though I have the coil voltage for the contactor disconnected, I'm still gonna tape up these leads. And there's no chance of them shorting out or something happening with the contactor. That way I can still energize the circuit. Always good to be sure. Done with that pressure control, so I'm just cutting the crap out so that way I can work. It's hard for me, but I'm trying to put my tools away as I go. I usually have a giant mess up here. A lot of nitrogen through it right now. Oh, 
We'll have to make sure we purge that really good. Looks like there's oil all in the condenser. I'm gonna have to unbrace the suction because there's not a lot of room there to figure out my fitting. might get a flame out here, so we got to be careful. Still pushing some nitrogen through even though it's just going into the suction line right now. We'll get this guy pulled out and then we'll get the new one set in and we won't open the plugs until we pipe it or get it ready. When you're lifting these style of compressors, stick a screwdriver through the lift port right there. It'll help you to do everything you need to do. We're gonna have to check the oil on that compressor, the old one, to make sure it's not severely low. We don't know what caused the discharge valve to go bad. This is ugly. We're gonna fix all this. This is nasty wiring. We're also gonna change both of those condenser fan motors too. We'll go ahead and cut. No, we won't. Oh yeah, we'll cut these right now. bolted back up. Like I said, we're going to do everything we can before we open up the compressor to the moist outside air. That way it's open to atmosphere for the least amount of time because like I said, it's really humid outside today. All right, so we're going to try to prep everything, get it ready. We've got some copper here that we're going to use to redo the stuff with. 
roll it out straight. Straight as possible, I should say. Tubing bender. Just kind of guesstimating where to bend it. Make it a little long. And then we'll clean it up once I need it. About right there. I use a marker when you're doing tubing bending. Kind of mark where you want to cut it. And then I say we're going to bend it about right there. That's my mark for my bender. There's an L right here on my bender. It's a little mark and that's where my bend's gonna be. So I line that up to that mark, bend, and then it's bent where I need it to be. And then we can proceed with what we're doing here. Just kind of guesstimating that it's gonna be bent about right there. Need to get some of this tape off of here. Again, just kind of mocking this up, kind of guessing where I think it's going to bend. About right there. I've got room to adjust things because I've got plenty of room here. So, Again, using my tubing bender, bend it down. Kind of mock things up. That looks like it'll work perfect. I'll be able to push that into that. Probably stretch a few things out a little bit here. off but I can fix it and then we're gonna mock up the this goes right into there we'll mock up the liquid dryer and then we'll uh, we'll open up the compressor and brace it in cleanliness is your best friend okay be careful with the sight glasses they're copper coated steel just give them a scuff that's all how not to react there's oil in there and it's hot if I tipped it over it would have poured out and possibly ignited on the roof so gotta be ready for that stuff don't panic dryer will go like that sight glass will go like that need to make about a 45 degree fitting here Match it to the 45 degree mark. Something like that. We'll cut it shorter on both ends.
cicadas outside. Worried about the side glass, so I need to get it cooled off quick, and then I'll finish the brazing. every one of my welds. line where it connects to the line going to the condenser. 
good. Start taking all this uh, stuff off, being careful because it's really hot. So we're at about 12 minutes. We've changed one PSI. Um, I'm, I'm not too worried about it. I'm gonna do a leak check on it on my welds and then we'll, uh, we'll continue with everything. So I sprayed some big blue on all of my saw or my braze joints. I don't see anything. Everything's looking good. No clusters of bubbles or anything. Uh, yeah, everything's looking cool. So we're gonna go ahead and proceed with uh, finishing this up and get the vacuum pump running and then we'll worry about electrical and I'm gonna change fan motors and stuff. The vacuum is doing good, still going strong, 700 microns. Um, I'm starting to run the electrical. Pressure control right here, crank seater going down through there. I'll wire everything in, I just got it pulled out for now. And I'm gonna go ahead and do the fan motors too and then we'll wire those in and uh, keep on going. I don't use these very often, but when you need them, they really come in handy for getting into these things, especially when some when these uh, blades, some manufacturers put them on backwards where the hub's going towards the motor and it's like almost impossible to get your normal Allen wrench. I carry a tiny Allen wrench for condenser fan motors and I got bigger ones in the truck, but. So I just finished cleaning up the electrical. I still got to zip tie some stuff and clean it up. It's de-energized right now. What we're doing, is uh, this is the line voltage on the top of the contactor. We're coming off a of line two, going directly to the compressor contactor coil to one side. So one side of that compressor contactor is always energized. The other side is coming off of line three and it's running through our pressure control. All the way over here to that dual pressure control, it runs through the dual pressure control as long as uh, the low side isn't open, or as long as the, the low side is closed and the high side is not open, then power will come back and energize the uh, the other side of the contactor coil. What happens is, is this unit does have electric defrost, so the time clock gets power and sends it downstairs on the number four terminal, runs through the temperature controller, and then comes back up, or runs through the temp control, turns on the solenoid valve, and then the system turns on and off via the pressure control. So that's what turns this contactor on and off. And then we have a crankcase heater up here, and then uh, condenser fan motor wiring on the bottom. So that's where we're at. I'm still cleaning stuff up. I still got to remove this and then set the time on the defrost clock. So I still have the compressor disconnected, but I bump started the condenser fan motors to check the rotation. They're going in the right rotation. Um, we're just about where we need to be on our microns and we'll do a decay test, um, but everything's looking good so far. We'll go ahead and get ready to hook this compressor up. And then, uh, yeah, I'm just still cleaning up, but pretty much the unit's all ready to go and ready to start up. While I'm waiting for the vacuum to finish, we're gonna go ahead and uh, pour out the oil out of this compressor and see if we're low on oil charge. Um, just because when I was cutting some of the lines, I had some oil blowing out, so we'll just do a quick test. It didn't have a bearing failure, so. I would expect a bearing failure or a grounded out compressor if we were low on oil. So the first thing we're gonna do is weigh our pan just so we know how much it weighs. Two pounds, 3.5 ounces. So I'm gonna mark that down and then we'll uh, continue on. Never gonna get all the oil out, but this thing looks like it has plenty of oil in it. So this compressor is supposed to have 45 ounces of oil in it. Um, I pulled out 35 ounces. I'm gonna call that good. I'm not worried about the few ounces of oil that are missing. 
there's still oil in that compressor and then also there's a little bit traveling through the system but that should be fine nothing to worry me so we held a good vacuum um, i'm currently charging the unit the unit currently has about four pounds of gas in it um, that's what i pulled out so we're going to start it up with that and then uh, field charge from there this unit does have a head pressure control valve so we got to make sure we put the right amount of refrigerant in there for that uh, with this particular system we can just weigh in the total charge but I want to see where the sight glass clears at, and then we'll add whatever else we need to. Now's the moment. Let's see what happens. Let it run for a few minutes. This unit should have a fan to lay on the evaporator. Sight glass is flashing. We want to give it a minute before we add gas. We don't want to overload this compressor. Let it run for a little bit here. It's under really heavy load right now. The RLA on the compressor is about nine amps and then right on the top it says operating max 10 amps. So we're just gonna watch it. It's running right now. We're at seven amps. We're definitely still low on charge. We're slowly gonna charge it but we just don't want to overload this guy with, uh, with refrigerant and make it go off on overload basically so we're just going to slowly charge it i'm telling you this box is 90 degrees so it's going to take a long time so we're going to slowly do this another way you could do it is you can also throttle a suction valve too kind of like a cpr valve so we're just going to slowly charge this thing and watch it come down in temp it's currently about 111 out here so i'd expect my saturation temperature to be about 20 uh over ambient being that it's a micro channel condenser and that's just a rule of thumb so with us having but again we're we're still flashing so we don't have a full charge in our system yet so 112 uh, we're, we're about on with our saturation temp but, we're, but again we got to clear the sight glass still so i'm just doing it slowly so it's been a while the box is coming down in temp but it is taking a long time we're at about 55 degrees right now i'm a little worried about how slow it's coming down um, the expansion valve is not frosting up. It looks like it's feeding properly, but I will say that the um, The distribution tubes coming out of the expansion valve are frosting up, but the coil is not frosting up um, Currently 55 degrees in the box our superheat is high I may go down there and try to adjust on that valve a little bit, but we'll see um, 52 psi we do have a pretty low suction the saturation temp is kind of low for the box temp but again, it's it's going crazy right now trying to come down. My head pressure is still pretty good on point. Um, yeah, so we're just watching it. This is my valve. And uh, my distribution tubes are frosting up. I did confirm though that is a pressure limiting expansion valve. So that could be part of the problem. I am gonna go ahead and try to adjust on it and I'm gonna pull that strainer and check it also. Yeah, something's up with this valve. Someone's been wrenching on it. It is uh, basically brought out as much, it's maxed out. The valve should be sitting in the mid position, so I can't open it. I can't, you know, bring the stem out anymore. So someone's been cranking on it. So we're definitely going to, uh, I don't know if I have a pressure limiting power head. This is a coil that kind of requires pressure limiting. Um, but I definitely want to pull that strainer. I'll have to see what I have here. Whoever installed this coil many years ago needs to get kicked in the head because they didn't give you anywhere to mount the sensing hole and they mounted it on the vertical. There's really nothing I can do. I got to put it back in the same place, but I ended up changing the power head. I checked the strainer, it's clean. So now what we're going to do is we're going to reset the superheat spring. So it's maxed all the way out. So what we're going to do is count how many turns it is to go all the way in and then split it in half, come back out halfway. And that'll be what the valve would come from the factory mid seated. What a difference. We've got suction pressure now. So yeah, power head was the issue. And there was a pressure limiting one in there. I didn't have that. So I just put a normal low temp. And what I'm going to do is adjust the defrost so the defrost doesn't happen as, um, as long of a duration so the box temp doesn't get so high. The fear is, is that coming out of defrost, because that's kind of like a hybrid freezer, they only get it down to 20 degrees. So, and it still does electric defrost. So the fear is, is that with the electric defrost, the box temp is gonna get too high. Um, unlike uh, the beer walk-in that I did a while back where 
they maintain 35. This one, they actually maintain 20 degrees. So there's a legit reason to have a freezer coil. Um, but yeah, we're looking good. We're not over amping on our compressor. We're still flashing on the sight glass. So I'm gonna let it run for a few more minutes and we might top off the charge a little bit more. And we're just, it looks like our box temp is 48 degrees right now and dropping. They're gonna see a huge, and superheat's 24 degrees down at the evaporator. So it's gonna be a little bit, but we should see a huge difference now. It's amazing what happens when your expansion valve's working right. So we're, we've got 17 degrees evaporator superheat. I'm not gonna adjust on it yet. I brought my box temp down to 35 degrees. So we've dropped like 15 degrees in like five minutes. It's kicking ass now. Our suction pressure, you know, anytime you're working on a system, you need to understand what your suction pressure should be and what your head pressure should be. You can use your rules of thumb and that'll get you in the ballpark, okay? Um, the evaporator TD approximately on this particular system should be about 10 degrees. So my evaporator saturated temp is 25 degrees and my box temp is 35 degrees. I have a 10 degree TD. That's about, so you can predict, if you have a 35 degree box temp, your saturation temp should be about 10 degrees below that on a walk-in. Now, you know, things can change if the system was designed funky or something. That's just a rule of thumb. And then as far as your head pressure, this is a micro-channel condenser. They usually run about 20 degrees over ambient. So condensing temp over ambient, CTOA, approximately 20 degrees over ambient. If this was a tube and fin condenser, I would expect it to be about 25 to 30 degrees over ambient. So that means that my ambient temp of 112 degrees, I should add about 20 degrees to that. So 122, 132, look at that. We have 135 degree liquid saturation temperature. That's pretty accurate. So it's about 23 degrees, you know, something like that, somewhere in there, 23 degrees over ambient. That's about accurate, okay? Now again, those are rules of thumb. You can't just do that and move on. You gotta look at everything. So the entire time while I'm working on this, I had an amp clamp on my compressor windings when I fixed that expansion valve and started it up. Um, I'm watching my sight glass. It makes a little more sense too because the factory charge on this said it was nine pounds and originally I had put about five pounds and I cleared the sight glass. But when I fixed that expansion valve's power head, all of a sudden I was flashing. So I put two more pounds in it, now my sight glass is clear. I still have to account for my head pressure control valve, but again, I'm being leery of adding extra refrigerant at this time just because it's so hot outside and I don't want to overcharge this unit at the moment. Um, so we're just watching it come down in temp, um, monitoring the box temp. It's kind of going in and out right now because I'm quite a ways away from the walk-in, but still the field piece probes are connected. So we're 34 degree box temp. We're set for about 20 degrees. So that's really good. Super heat. Um, we really don't want to start wrenching on the, the expansion valve until we're within about five degrees of set temp. So once we get to about um, 25 degrees box temp, then I would expect my superheat to fall in line. Um, I'm, a, I'm expecting that superheat to be about eight to 10 degrees superheat. Very important that when you're done with a system like this where you're worried about it being overcharged that you pump it down at the receiver. Make sure that it pumps down effortlessly. So this one was running around 390 head pressure and I pumped it down, it went up to about 403 and then it stopped. So that to me tells me that we're fine and we're not overcharged. So this box uh, kind of hit a brick wall, which I expect it to. Um, it's sitting right around 35, 30 degrees. It's gonna take a little while. My superheat kind of calmed down. Um, my superheat basically, uh, I can't remember where it was running last. 14 degrees or something like that. So we're just gonna let the box stabilize out, tell them to keep an eye on it. We'll probably come back because they have an AC that has a bad condenser fan motor, so we're gonna be back probably tomorrow. Get that going, follow up on this guy, make sure it's down to temp and everything. It's gonna take a while, because you remember that box has been, well, I didn't tell you guys, but the box has been down for three days. So, you know, it was it was probably over 100. I said 90 earlier, it was probably over 100 in there. So it's expected that it's taken a long time to come down to town. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this back together. So I came back out here to do a follow-up. Uh, superheat's a little bit low. Box temp is a little bit low. They wanna maintain about 30 degrees in here. So we're gonna adjust the box temp and we're gonna increase that superheat a little bit because it's running a little bit low at one degrees. 
The coil's looking good, no frosting problems, everything's straight with that. There is a fan motor going bad, I'm probably gonna change that because I just want this to be done. But yeah, so we're gonna increase the super heat. Shouldn't be hard at all. There you go. Just about a half a turn to uh, raise the superheat on this guy and we'll see what happens. That's a little bit better, it didn't take much. It really doesn't take much for a superheat adjustment on one of these valves and you really gotta give it time to, to accept that adjustment and stabilize out. So I'm not gonna twist on this valve anymore. Even though I'd like to see a little bit closer to six to eight, we're gonna leave it be at nine. And mind you, that's not always gonna stay at nine. It's gonna, it's gonna you know, range a little bit as the, as the valve opens and closes, so. We're good to go. I'm gonna uh, go ahead and uh, look into changing that motor, see what we gotta do to do that. Much better now that it's not making that bearing noise. So yeah, we're good to go. We're gonna just double check on the defrost and then wrap this one up. All right, so this was another call that led to one thing that led to another, okay? Um, looking at the big picture, we tend to run into these things like this all the time, it seems like. So we had a service call on a walk-in cooler. It's, it's kind of hard to call it a walk-in cooler because like I said, it's a hybrid walk-in cooler. They run it at about 28 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature they maintain inside this box. So it's not necessarily a walk-in freezer per se because most of the time walk-in freezers are at zero or negative 10, somewhere in there. But anyways, uh, we had a service call on a walk-in cooler that wasn't working properly. I found that the unit had a bad compressor contactor the coil was open, okay? Once I replaced the compressor contactor, I noticed that it was immediately short cycling on, off, on, off. I had a hunch because of how hot it was that there was a problem with the high pressure control. So I bypassed the high pressure control and the problem went away, the short cycling issue. So we confirmed that the high pressure control was the issue. Once I went ahead and started the system up without the high pressure control, I noticed that the compressor was making a, a horrible sound coming from the valves inside the compressor. It was bypassing internally is what was happening. So the compressor has an internal pressure relief and that pressure relief was bad. Um, more than likely what caused this all was uh, high temperatures um, and I made an assumption to think that maybe a condenser fan motor was failing or something because the condenser wasn't dirty. I know I didn't show that in the video but something caused the, the discharge valve or the, the pressure relief within the, uh, the compressor itself to fail, and that was probably a high pressure issue. So that's why I changed the condenser fan motors at the same time. Um, so we went ahead and replaced the compressor contactor, both condenser fan motors, the compressor, and then we put a new dual pressure control. Um, after I started the system back up, I noticed that we were running a very low suction pressure and found that the uh, expansion valve was not working properly. So I went ahead and changed the power head on the expansion valve. And then I also found that someone had been wrenching on the superheat adjustment um, screw on the expansion valve. And it was basically backed all the way out to, uh, to drop the superheat as low as possible. Uh, that's not good either because expansion valves shouldn't be maxed one way or the other. They typically sit in the mid seated position. So um, went ahead and set that back into the mid seated position let the unit run for the rest of the night, came back out the next day, um, found that the superheat was a little bit low, so adjusted it a little bit higher, got it to about nine degrees, which, you know, I'd have been a little bit happier with, you know, six to eight degrees, somewhere in there, but I wasn't gonna fuss too much with it. Um, and then I also changed that evaporator fan motor that had the screaming bearings in it. So this definitely was uh, a multiple, you know, issues on this service call, but it's just, this is how it goes, okay? Like I said, when we're looking at the big picture, we tend to find problems like this, okay? Um, customer was happy, that call, it's been about, it was earlier this week, so it's been about four days. Customer, everything's been going great. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Uh, really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch these videos. Um, I really, really appreciate the feedback you guys leave. Uh, if you don't already know, please leave me some feedback down in the YouTube comments. Uh, send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com with any questions. And uh, uh, that's pretty much it. I really appreciate it. And we will catch you guys on the next one, okay?